Okay, hello everyone and welcome to this evening's webinar focusing on mindfulness and relaxation and how it relates to sports performance. I am Tommy Shipik. I will be the moderator of this evening. Uh, but before we get into our content uh, and our introduction of our incredible speaker, um, just a few housekeeping items for everyone. Um, first off, thank you uh, for everyone who is tuning in live. And also thank you to those who are tuning in to the recorded version uh, at a later date. Um, questions are definitely encouraged, but go ahead and please save them for either the end of the webinar or go ahead and put them into our chat feature. Uh, at the end of the webinar, we will have 15 minutes or so to have open discussion and some questions. So feel free to utilize that chat. I will be kind of triaging that as we go and I'm picking out some questions for Meg at the end. Um, lastly, this webinar is brought to you by our Youth Lead Program here at Blaze Sports, which focuses on the development of our youth throughout our various programming initiatives and resources. All right, so now that all is finished, go ahead and introduce our incredible speaker. So uh, Margaret uh, Meg Smith uh, is joining us tonight. She is a sport and performance psychology consultant based in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, she's on the staff with the US Olympic Commission's team, USA Wheelchair Rugby, uh, the U.S. Navy's Warrior Games and Military Adapted Sports Program, uh, the University of Alabama Adapted Athletics, um, and also she works with other schools and organizations uh, with both Olympic and Paralympic sport. In addition to all of that, she also hold, holds a PhD in social psychology, uh, studying specifically how social and cultural context shape learning and, and performance. Um, to top that all off, she's also a registered yoga teacher and part of the Trauma Center's Trauma Sensitive Yoga Facilitation Program. All right, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and hand over the virtual microphone to you, Meg. Thank you so much, Tommy, and, and thank you all for joining and for being here and, and for your interest. It's really cool to get to know the Blaze Sports community a little bit, and uh, I, I hope that, that this can be a conversation. Um, I'll caveat what Tommy said. I, I, I would love your questions. I often say things that don't make sense or um, use words that, that people think are, are maybe um, unnecessary. Uh, so please stop me if I'm not making sense. You can put it in the chat. You can holler it out. Um, it, I, I want to, I want to be clear. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. You can see how I might get a little bit unclear sometimes. So, so I hope that, um, that, that you will feel, feel, um, like this is a dialogue and, and, and let's, let's, let's talk. So I, I'm, I'm ready if y'all are, or if you yes. have Okay, let's cool. go ahead and also uh, Meg just give me uh, a quick notification that you want would like me to move on to the next slide or I'll okay. back. Okay, thank you. <laughs> no problem. Okay, wow. All right. So I, I called this relaxation and high performance. But in truth, I could have used a lot of words other than relaxation, we could have called it co-regulation and high performance. We could have called it ventral vagal tone and high performance. We could have called it body awareness and high performance. We could have called it feelings and high performance. Um, I chose relaxation because I think everyone has some connotations with this word. And often um, those connotations are, are evaluative in some way, they're not neutral. Like maybe I love relaxation and I crave it and I want to do it all the time. Or maybe I associate relaxation with people thinking I'm lazy or um, that, that it's shameful to relax when other people are working. Um, so, so we have kind of maybe loaded senses of this word and it can vary with context. And so I guess I would like for us to talk a little bit about why relaxation 
is so important to high performance and to team cohesion, particularly whether that's um, whether that's a team that's participating in a synchronous sport um, like like basketball or rugby or teams that are competing asynchronously like swimming and track and field. Um, team cohesion and high performance go together and relaxation will define that um, is, is a big part of that. So, so I've got um, some, some extra extraneous words here on this slide, mindfulness and loving kindness and body-based practices. Um, and that's, that's mainly what we're gonna get to are, are some practices that maybe you might use with your teams or with yourself um, to, to cultivate the kind of um, body awareness that is really important for being able to co-regulate with, with your teammates, so the people you're performing with and for yourself and performance. So we can move to the next slide, Tommy. Oh, thank you. Um, so, so I love this picture here. Um, so oh, that's my, my name and contact information. So you're welcome to shoot me an email um, at any time. Let me know that, that I was uh, not making sense because that does happen quite a bit, but I love this picture so much. Um, one, because I took it and I'm a really terrible photographer. Everyone who knows me knows that, that, you know, my camera, you know, takes like one frame every 17 seconds. So you never know what the image you're going to get is going to be. Um, but I chose this picture to put on this slide because I think anyone who's looking at it, um, who wasn't there, who didn't take the picture, might not know or might not associate this photo with the word relaxation. Relaxation might not be the very first word that comes to mind when you see this picture, or maybe it was for you. I don't know. If anyone saw this and thought relaxation, please holler it out. I, I, would, I would love to be proven wrong there. But I, I thought this might be a little bit of a contradiction here because it looks like, um, it looks like well, I don't know, what does it look like to you? What would you say? Anyone wanna? I, I'll, I'll take a crack at it, if, if, if I may. Ooh. Taking off the lenses of, I know this sport, okay? So just taking off those lenses real quick. It looks like two uh, aggressive individuals fighting over that ball. That's what I was gonna say. It looks like I can hear the picture and I can hear them grunting. Um, at each other and maybe the metal of the uh, wheelchair like grinding into the floor. It looks, it feels very aggressive. I love those sensory descriptions. That's wonderful. That's that's like some super body awareness right there is, is five senses. I love it. And so, so they, they actually may have been grunting a little bit when this photo was taken, but they were also laughing. And what's happening with relaxation here is what we can call co-regulation. So you have two teammates, this is pre-game, this is before an international tournament, and they're having fun together. They wanted a picture together. Like, hey, could you take a really cool picture of us before the game? And the fact that they asked me to take a really cool picture of them it is like a huge amount of trust because both of them know I don't take good pictures and and they wanted a cool picture. So they're trusting each other to make a cool picture. They're trusting me to take a cool picture. Um, we can call this co-regulation, co co-regulation of nervous systems, which means that we are tuning in to one another and we are regulating together. And in order to do that in a social way, we have to be um, a little bit relaxed. We have to not have our defenses up really high. We have to not be in a state of responding to threat. So these athletes here are in a state of safety such that they can play together. They're doing something together that's fun. They're enjoying one another. They're having a moment of play. They're co-regulating their nervous systems before a game. Um, so that's a little bit of what we are going to talk about tonight. It, did I, did I make any sense there? Anybody have questions that I confused you thoroughly yet? Cool. Okay. So maybe next slide then tell me, thank you. Okay. So a little agenda for tonight. We're going to talk really briefly about polyvagal theory 
and the socialness of our nervous systems. And we are social beings and our nervous systems are wired for social interaction. And, and, and so social interaction is very important to how we respond to situations, how our nervous systems respond to situations and how some of the major challenges of high performance, which include really being very present in, in a situation that could be high stress, high threat, um, that, that there's some parallels to high performance um, with, with how our nervous system respond to, to trauma. So we can learn some things from trauma science um, about how our nervous systems are going to um, to respond in a in a in a situation that could be very stressful, and so then we're going to talk a little bit more about how how we co-regulate, how we are social beings, and how our nervous systems are are also social, and so how we can use that understanding to cultivate our own body awareness and also to cultivate body awareness as a team so that we can do things together, we can co-regulate together and perform um, at, at an optimal level the way we wanna perform. And we'll talk about a couple of practices that you can try. It's definitely not an exhaustive list of practices, um, just a few things that we can, we can talk about depending on what your interests are. So next slide, please, Tommy. Thank you. So our autonomic nervous system, again, we are, we're, we're mammals and uh, mammals are, are evolved to, to care for other mammals. We, we spend a lot of time cultivating our young as mammals um, and our autonomic nervous systems are attuned to acts of care giving care and receiving care. Um, and, and I've heard some, some people say that the term caregiver is really not a great one for, for mammals like us um, because caregiver implies that it's a one way, someone's giving. When as mammals who co-regulate, um, it's really always a loop. We are our, our caregiving in, in relationship to one another and we're, we're co-regulating together and that's what our mammalian nervous systems were, were made to do. And so our autonomic nervous system has these two branches, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And we're gonna be focused on the, um, well, we'll talk about both. We'll talk about both. We'll go into a little bit more detail about the parasympathetic nervous system, but the sympathetic nervous system is probably what you're all really familiar with, the fight flight. And the parasympathetic nervous system has, has these two different branches. And we've got the ventral vagus branch and the dorsal vagus branch. And the ventral vagus branch is what, um, what people talk about when they talk about vagal theory and vagal stimulation and, and tapping into your vagus nerve. Um, but, but our vagus nerve has these different branches and the ventral vagus is our, our safe and social state. Um, this is, this is what influences our heart rates and our breathing and moves us into a place where we can be safe and engage with other people. Our dorsal vagus, dorsal vagus branch, um, is what is going to take us into that really primitive state of protection of ourselves when, when there's a threat. So, so when, when, we, when we sense a threat that we feel we can't escape from, it's our dorsal vagus branch that's going to send us into immobilization so that whatever the threat is maybe just passes us by because we're not that interesting for it anymore. And so, so it's... Um, it's a functional feature that our bodies develop to help us survive really intimidating threats. Our bodies don't always know um, if a threat is a, a real threat or if it's a threat that we perceive to be a threat. So our feelings really matter here. If we perceive it to be real and if we perceive it to be something we can't escape from, we are likely to go into this kind of immobilization or shutdown. If we can get into to tone of this, this ventral vagus system where we can sort of pause and evaluate um, what's going on in my body, why might it be responding in this way, then we might be able to get into this kind of safe, safe and social engagement system. 
Um, so I know that's a lot of information not explained very well, but um, if there are questions we can we can talk or we can get them as we move forward. I'll let y'all y'all tell me what's best. I would have to say that it was uh, explained quite well. <laughs> oh, thanks, Tommy. From someone who uh, has a very rudimentary understanding of, of our nervous system. I thought you connected a lot of points together. Oh, cool. Well, well, maybe we can pick up questions as we move on then, if, if, that, if that's all right with everyone. Okay. Next slide. Yeah, next slide. Thank you. Okay, so so a couple quotes here from from some giants of the field here. These are from from trauma science. Um, chronic stress and trauma are not the same thing. That's that's really important to 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 point out. However, they both dysregulate our nervous system in particular ways and sometimes in similar ways. And I think it's helpful to know about those ways of, of dysregulation and um, kind of the, the main pathways for regulating that dysregulation because it applies to sport performance as well. And so this first quote here comes from Bess Bessel van der Kolk, whose name you may be familiar with. Um, he is the author of the book that's been on the bestseller list throughout the pandemic, but, but you know, it was published in 2011 or 2014, 2014. Okay. It's right there. Um, it's called the body keeps the score. And so, so he's saying trauma produces actual physiological changes in our bodies and it recalibrates the brain's alarm system an increase in stress hormone activity and alterations in the system that filters relevant information from irrelevant. Right. So that's, that's that, that threat detection we were just talking about. But we will also see the imprints of the past can be transformed by having physical experiences that directly contradict the helplessness, rage, and collapse that are part of trauma, and thereby regaining self-mastery. So this really important piece here, right? If we can have physical experiences that directly contradict helpless, helplessness or rage or collapse, then we can... Yeah. <laughs> And so, so those physical experiences, that's one thing that's really important there. Second thing here, this is from Judith Herman, whose book Trauma and Recovery is, is um, hugely influential in the field of trauma studies. And she's saying that recovery is, is all about the empowerment of the survivor and the creation of connections. Recovery can take place only within the context of relationships. It cannot occur in isolation. In her renewed connections with other people, the survivor recreates the psychological faculties that were damaged or deformed by traumatic experience. These faculties include the basic capacities for trust, autonomy, initiative, competence, identity, and intimacy. So, so we need these physical experiences in which we are empowered. So Herman is saying the same thing as van, van der Kolk. And she's also saying that these have to happen in community, in connection, meaningful connections with others. So this is, again, this idea of co-regulation, that we are social beings, that we are involved, um, you know, we are, we are made to be involved in care, caregiving, care receiving in reciprocal ways. And, and we really need that to heal from anything that dysregulates our nervous system. So again, I know we're talking about high performance. We're not talking about um, trauma. We're not talking about chronic stress. However, we are living in amid multiple traumas for many people and, and many people undergoing chronic stress. And so I think one, it's these are, are helpful um, helpful pieces of wisdom from these these real giants um, at any time. But I think particularly right now, given what everyone's been experiencing for the past couple of years, um, could be relevant for your teams. But at all times, um, we're going to see in just a second some parallels between um, the, the sort of, of precision autonomic nervous system regulation that some trauma therapists use and the ways that we think about optimal performance in sports psychology. So Tommy, could we see the next slide? 
Thank you. So I know this is not very good quality picture and you definitely don't need to read all the text, um, but this is Babette Rothschild's Precision Autonomic Nervous System, System Regulation graphic. And so she's a trauma therapist writing for other trauma therapists, but I've just got this here to show you in just a second um, how similar this looks to what we talk about when we talk about optimal sport performance. So she's got this, um, this, this graphic here and she's, she's color coded it, I think, um, in line with, um, with like the TSA threat detection with the, so, so color coded. And so, so at the very far left, we have like a high parasympathetic state where we are lethargic and apathetic and very low in energy. Um, and then moving towards a safe, clear thinking, social engagement zone. And a little beyond that is a higher sympathetic tone, but where we're still clear thinking and where we're alert and we're ready to act and we're sharp. And then we start to go a little bit further over and that sharpness maybe fades a little bit into reactivity. And so when we become reactive, we're in a, which she's calling sympathetic too. Um, we're a little, a little, a little too much, a little extra in the sympathetic system. And so we might be able to, um, to react to danger. We might not be as strategic or as thoughtful about how we respond to the, to the danger in that sympathetic two state. Then beyond that, we have what she's calling sympathetic three or hyper freeze. And this is like, this is the deer in headlights. This is the high tone, like rigid muscles. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, locked in my body. And beyond that, that's, that's the immobilization, the hypo freeze where it's total collapse. So, so you can sort of see here, maybe an inverted U where we're lethargic on one end, we're gaining energy, we're gaining energy, and maybe then we're rigid, we are immobilized, we're in collapse. That's all I really want to highlight from, from this graphic. Um, Tommy, can we see the next slide? Yeah, actually, we, we have a question. In oh, good, cool. The, uh, go ahead, Michelle. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you for... Uh, presenting on this this evening. I have my question, and you may go over this later, how, if you move through this and you end up in the hypo freeze mm -hmm. column, what steps can you take or the people around you take to move you back closer? What is the optimal zone? And if you end up moving through these quickly, through this mm -hmm. continuum quickly, how do you quickly rebound to go back to a zone that is optimal for any kind of performance, not just sports performance? That's such a great question. <laughs> and, and I wish I had like a, a really wonderful answer to, to give you there. Um, it's complicated and contextual. And sometimes if we get as far as the hypo freeze state, we really may need medical professionals. We may need um, clinicians to, to assist in the situation. Um, but if we know somebody's headed in that direction, something that's really important um, is, is training this ventral vagal complex, this, this thing that, that, um, that allows us to be in the safe and social state, to be able to pause for just a moment and assess the situation to be able to decipher um, what's a real threat in this moment from what, what may not be an actual threat at this time. And so with some social support, like with the support of a team, with coaches, with people who care and who, who want to know the whole human being, um, we can, can create these kinds of zones of safety where it becomes safe enough to socially engage and to train this like ventral vagal complex. 
if we don't, you know, if we, if we haven't had the time together to be able to cultivate that community and we see it happening, we see someone escalating, um, it can be really tricky to intervene. And, and, and I am not a clinician. I operate only in the world of sport performance. So I, I, I don't want to, um, give any false ideas of my competence and that I know how to intervene in all situations. But depending on the situation, you, you may be able to co-regulate a little bit and model some deep breaths or even wide breaths, um, whatever, whatever can be accessed and slowly exhaling. So you're maintaining your own parasympathetic calm that ventral vagal state where you're safe and clear thinking and you can identify, okay, so this person is escalating here. Is there someone nearby who they trust who might be able to, to touch them in a calming way? Or is there someone nearby whose face they can see and they can see that face and they can know this person is, is calm, this person I trust is calm and I'm safe with this person. Um, if there's not another person, your own face may be a cue, right? If you're in that ventral vagal state and you can, can show them calm and you can show them genuine care, which you know often comes from the upper part of the face, like the way your eyes crinkle when you smile and, um, and the expression that you, you show, you may be able to, to reflect to this person that some cues of safety may not always be the case, but it's a possibility. And so in cultivating our own kind of ventral vagal complex tone, our, our ability to take that pause and assess the situation, um, we may be able to share those cues of safety with people around us. Thank you. It's a great question. <laughs> Deserves a much better answer and a, um, a much more qualified speaker. No, that that was that was that was very helpful, actually. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and you know what, Meg, before we move on, I just have this one point that I, I feel like I have to make. Uh, so when you brought this image up, right, um, and you mentioned that this is also something that you can it can relate to sport performance, I was okay I can't wait to hear this and, and as you were explaining it I just had light bulbs going off and, and going back to some coaching cues that we use in our programming right so like stay loose right or or you know to bring yourself down from that you know sympathetic three you know when you're in that competition so you want to be level-headed you want to make good decisions um it was just light bulb light bulb light bulb going off and I was like wow this is this is awesome. So I just, just had to. Yay. Well, you know, so much of, of at least from someone with as limited uh, kind of competence as I have, like anything that I'm going to share with you is probably something you already know and you already practice. And I'm just putting um, somebody else's really great words on top of it. You may or may not need the words, um, but sometimes like seeing your own actions through someone else's lens can be useful for reflecting on on practice and that's awesome extremely extremely useful thank you oh yeah well, thank you thank you tommy well want to look at the next slide here so we've got we've got our threat um, again so babette rothschild is is a a, a a clinician she she serves survivors of trauma um, and so she's not concerned with sport performance and yet she's got this this graphic of um of our autonomic nervous system that very much looks like this inverted u of optimal performance which probably you have seen or heard of um you know when people talk about being in the zone right the zone of, of optimal performance they're like right right at the, the the highest point of that inverted u where you are optimally aroused to respond to the situation you're not taken out of the situation. You're in that, that flow state where you can put all of your training into that present moment 
and be able to to perform optimally and so again like if we were if we were too low if we were in that parasympathetic state of, of lethargy that that Babette Rothschild is is calling the the first green there and we're not going to be um primed for sport performance and if we're in a state of of you know tonic immobility or complete collapse we're also not going to be able to perform optimally. So we want to be in that, that state that she's calling sympathetic one, probably, but also kind of that parasympathetic, um, that, that green color where we can be safe and socially engaged and clear thinking, but also ready to respond in, um, in a way that, that we've trained to be able to respond. So this inverted view of athletic performance goes way back to um, it's called a Yerkes Dodson law of 1908, um, but it, it very much resembles what um, what trauma scientists are, are are identifying in terms of of autonomic nervous systems that are responding to um, responding to perceived threats. So maybe we can take a look at the the so so I, the. The idea here is how do we get into that state of optimal arousal? Um, and so maybe we can take a look at the next slide, Tommy. Thank you. So, so I've got here on this slide a couple of mind-body practices that can be useful to explore when we're exploring getting into that state of optimal arousal, right? So if we want to be able to be clear thinking and socially engaged and also responsive, but not reactive to situations. Um, we know from, from the science in both sports psychology and in performance psychology, as well as in um, science of trauma and recovery, that mind-body practices can be really beneficial. And so, um, so you probably heard a little bit about mindfulness. You may have heard of loving kindness meditations, um, myofascial release, maybe something you're familiar with. And, and yoga is definitely out there in lots of forms on the internet, not all of which are, are real yogic. Um, but we're gonna talk about, about mind-body practices that can help us be in that state of optimal arousal where we can harness some ventral vagal tone to be able to engage and also to be able to harness some of that energy of the sympathetic nervous system that's going to allow us to respond quickly to the situation at hand. Now, this is not an exhaustive list of, of ways for um, practicing roots into optimal arousal. Um, and I, I think probably one of the most important things that, that you all are already doing um, and already very familiar with goes back to that picture at the very beginning of the presentation with the two athletes who are playing and who are enjoying one another's company and who are wholly attuned to one another and to doing something cool together. And that state of play and that kind of um, ability to be socially engaged with one another and, and tuned into caring for each other and doing something cool together. That's, that's also a mind body practice. And that's something that you all do all the time with your teams in practice, really whatever you're doing, that's, that's always happening. So you're training your athletes to co-regulate their nervous systems, which is I think super cool. Um, so I didn't have that on the slide, uh, but but that's something we can we can also talk about. Um, in addition to what you're already doing, and you may already be doing all of these things here, um, these are practices that you might try for yourself to see what they're like to experience, and or try with your athletes to see how they experience it. Um, so I suppose I want to see, um, what interest y'all have, um, if, if you'd like to try some mind body practices right now, and if any of these sound of interest to you, and, and then we'll kind of go from there. All 
Uh, yes, I think that would be great. Uh, Meg, I'm going to put that question right back onto you. Why don't you go ahead uh, and help us do one of your favorite ones? Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Well, cool. Well, I, I like them all. Um, I wonder, I wonder, are y'all familiar with myofascial release? Might have some, I'm sure probably have people who are, are much more um, well-versed in the fascia than I am, but, but does anyone use this with their teams and athletes already? We do. We do. I have, um, I have a, a massage gun that we utilize, uh, mainly used like during competition for basketball, since that's very high intensity, you might get some cramps and all that stuff. Um, but it's something that we've, we've just introduced this season. And, and I think that it's been very um, impactful. And I plan to bring that wonderful massage gun to every single competition, whether it be basketball, swim, tennis, uh, or track and field. I love it. That's great. The massage gun's always really popular with athletes and staff for good reason. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, so, so we're familiar then with the power of, of touch and with, um, with the impact that our skin and our fascia have on our nervous system. And so maybe we'll kind of combine some of these things here for, for just a moment. If y'all want to, we can, we can do a little bit of a, um, a myofascial exercise here and we'll, um, and we'll, we'll try some other things too. So if you're interested right now, maybe um, just notice where you are at and maybe start to notice your breath. Notice how you inhale and notice your exhale. And maybe if it's accessible to you right now, you might breathe in through your nose. And then exhale through your nose. And if it's not accessible to you to breathe through your nose today, that's completely fine. You can breathe through your mouth. Seeing if you can extend the length of your exhale just a little bit longer than your inhale. Maybe just a couple more breaths like that, breathing in naturally. Breathing out nice and slow. Breathing in naturally. Breathing out nice and slow. And if you'd like, you might take a hand or knuckles or the, the, the bone of your wrist, you might bring it to the back of your head, to that place where your neck meets your skull and your skull starts to round out a little bit from the back of your head. And this is that occipital region of your head. And there's a lot of muscles back here that do a lot of work that don't always get a lot of love. So maybe you might start to move your fingers or your knuckles around in there and see if you can find a spot that feels nice to bring some awareness and attention to. Maybe continuing to notice the length of your exhales as you feel around there for any spot that feels nice or that's asking for your attention. And you might even find a place where your hands and arms can be still and you can lean your head back into your hands or your arms. And if you were in a place where you were laying down, say on the floor, you might rock your head from side to side, or you might rock your head from side to side against your hands or your arms or your wrist bone or whatever you've brought to, to the back of your head there. You might explore 
one side, maybe bringing your nose over as far as it wants to go and taking a breath. And then as you inhale, maybe coming about halfway back to center and starting to make some little circles with your nose, leaning your head back against your hands or your arms or the floor. And you can explore the size and size of the circles, the speed of the circles, see what feels nice. And when you're ready, maybe taking a moment to pause and notice, and then to bring your head towards the other direction. We'll repeat on the other side, finding a size or a shape or a rhythm that feels nice for you. And this occipital region of your brain is the part of your brain that is responsible for processing images, both the images that you see with your eyes and also the things that you imagine, the things you see with your mind. So it's a really hard working area of your brain and also a really hard working area of your outer body holding your head up. I'm just taking a moment here to breathe into any tension. Inhaling naturally. Exhaling nice and slow. And when you're ready, letting your arms relax, maybe wiggling your fingers a little bit, maybe taking a roll of your shoulders. Continuing with those nice long exhales. You could dip your chin down towards your collarbone. Maybe make a little smiley face with your chin from collarbone to collarbone if that feels good. Kind of stretching the back of your neck just a bit. Or just continuing to breathe. Nice long exhales. And when you're ready, we'll come back together. And I'd love to hear about your experience, anything you noticed in your mind or your body as you brought some awareness to that occipital region of your head. Uh, I know for, for myself, I was initially thinking while we were doing this, how beneficial these techniques would be for, for our athletes, like the, the slow, meaningful breathing before competition, mm -hmm. you know, leading up to a practice or post-practice that mind body connection of, you know, feeling around in the neck and whatnot. Um, I felt very connected more so to my, to my, to my body that I think I've done all day. Um, so it was, it was, it was great. I'm just always thinking of how can we use these things? I, I that was very in, enjoyable. Your occipital region is, is visualizing your athletes, right? You got, you got, you, I love it. I love it. You're seeing them all the time, the hardworking area. Yeah. And so, so that's one practice of, of kind of self myofascial release that um, could be a way to, to integrate a mind body practice into practice, right? Maybe it takes three minutes to do um, and, and trains that, that ventral vagal complex to take that pause and to notice what's going on in my own body. And when I notice what's going on in my own body, then I can, um, can maybe be in a better place to, um, 
to respond to this situation in the way that I, I want to respond to the situation. I have a little bit more control over my own energy. And I also have energy for the people around me um, and, and how they're responding to the situation. And I think it's really important, I need to, to say, like in, in suggesting a practice like that, um, that it's gonna be different for every athlete and for every staff member what kind of mind body practice they find most beneficial. And so encouraging um, your own athletes to try things and it's okay if you don't like it, we'll find another way um, for, for you to get into your body and to notice your body. Like there's lots and lots of tools. There's lots of ways we can do this um, and we'll find what works for you. It doesn't have to be anything grand or, or large, it could be really three minutes a day doing what works for that athlete. It just may take a little bit of trial and error to find what an athlete enjoys and appreciates in the different contexts that they're going to be in. And, and so it's also, I think, super important for coaches and staff and parents and, and all the support around an athlete um, who, who are supporting the team to also explore these mind-body practices for themselves so that they have access to them and, and you know you can you can be able to know what works in your own body and be able to have that pause for yourself. Um, and then then it, it gives back that little bit of energy so that we can respond in the way that we wish to respond. So so I it, it this is one example. If you hate it, that's totally fine. That if it doesn't work for you, that's totally fine. Um, I'm sorry. I, I, if, I'm sorry if it didn't. I wish you know. I wish we could hit the magic button every time. But um, but it's something to try. And and there are many different ways of exploring myofascial release, self myofascial release. Um, just like there's many different ways of practicing yoga. Um, we'll, maybe we'll talk in just a moment about a loving kindness meditation. Try that one. I think I've got a slide. Maybe, maybe the next slide. Can we see Tommy? I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but before, before we move on, I believe that we have, may have had a question in oh, cool. the audience, I uh, believe from Michelle, that's true. She, she answered it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So moving on to the next one. Oh, cool. Okay. So this, this is not the slide that I thought, um, this, this works too. Um, actually, Tommy, can we skip this one for now, Tommy, and come back? Yeah, I think the next Sorry. one's the one that you are. Looking for. <laughs> okay. So, so loving kindness meditation, um, may be something you're familiar with already. And there are many different ways of practicing a loving kindness meditation. I took this one from Sharon Salzberg, who, um, who, who, writes widely about loving kindness and loving kindness practices. And I like this one for providers or for parents or for support staff. Um, but you could practice it as a team with athletes too. Um, so, so for a loving kindness meditation, um, I like to suggest if it's something that you're comfortable doing, again, finding a comfortable body position and your eyes might be open or they might be closed or they might be soft in their gaze. You could bring a hand to your heart if you like. And you could picture someone you love very much. You could picture your athletes. You could picture someone who reflects love to you. You could picture yourself. You could picture someone who's very challenging to you. Not judging what images come to your mind. And maybe saying to yourself these words from Sharon Salzberg, may I offer my care and presence unconditionally, knowing that I may be met by gratitude, indifference, anger, or anguish. May I offer compassion, knowing that I cannot control the course of life or of suffering. May I be peaceful and let go of expectations. 
May I recognize my own limitations. Maybe taking a breath here. Nice long exhale. So whenever you're ready, allowing your arms to relax, your gaze to, to focus again. And would welcome any thoughts of your experience here, either of this particular meditation or of, of loving kindness meditations you've practiced before, or um, any thoughts about how you might use this or questions about how you might use this. One area that, that I find may be really impactful using this is, is if an athlete may, maybe they could use this if they're having a particularly difficult time with a skill or, you know, outside or inside of practice or something like that. I think that would be a great way for the, them to kind of self-regulate and focus in on that they are, you know, supported and cared for and um, things like that, which, which, you know, taking that time isn't often accessible in that high paced sport world. So um, I think it'd be great. So that's, that's where my mind went directly. I love that. I love that, Tommy, because I, I, I would imagine um, if, if your athletes are anything like the athletes I often work with, they are their own harshest critics and they, they can be very hard on themselves. And so a well, loving kindness meditation, the idea is, is developing self-compassion as much as compassion more broadly. And it, it's really hard to have compassion more broadly if we don't have self-compassion. Um, so, so the name of this book that this comes from is A Heart as Wide as the World, right? Like compassion, just radiating compassion. But it's really hard to radiate compassion if we're beating ourselves up all the time. So an athlete misses a shot or makes a, a mistake on court or on the field of play, they're probably not going to stop and put their hand over their heart and, and, and say this meditation. I, I would never expect that. However, if this is something that you practice regularly outside of competition, the feeling there, the, the ventral vagal tone becomes accessible to you in high stakes situations. So it's just like any other area of your training. You're training this relaxation system to be accessible to you when you need it so that you have control over your energy. You can use your energy. You can direct your energy to the demands of the present moment rather than directing energy into like self-flagellation and self-criticism and um, beating myself up for missing that shot or whatever it is. If I've, if I've cultivated self-compassion, if I've, I've practiced toning this ventral vagal system, then that ventral vagal system becomes much more efficiently accessible to me when I need it. So that's the, 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 the why behind something like this. So again, it does not have to be this meditation. It does not have to be these words. Um, it's really whatever works for you, works for the athlete. Um, they may want to write their own words. Um, they may want to write them with you or with a person whom they trust. And, and that's wonderful. The, the important part is doing the practice on a regular basis of having that moment of tuning in to, to, to the compassion that we have access to for ourselves and others. Uh, we have a, a question in the audience, uh, Michelle. Sorry. Um, no, this comes to mind when our athletes uh, can use this also in school. They are very competitive on the court, in the pool, you know, on the track. That, that competitiveness or high expectation of self also translates to the classroom and the expectations they have of themselves. So it may be easier for them to do this before a big test or in the classroom and then their nervous system is used to them doing it. So in a high stakes 
sporting events where things are moving really quickly, uh, they can uh, employ it. But also as the parents of athletes, we get caught up in the emotion of the sport too. So if we're able to learn this loving kindness, we can model it um, for our athletes and also help them move through it when we recognize their emotions go in a different way. I love that so much. That's, thank you. That's perfectly said. Maybe we can take a look at that, that previous slide, Tommy. Um, the great, yeah. And so, so I, this is um, a little mnemonic that that I think reflects. Um, I think Michelle, you said it. You said it perfectly. This is this is what we're trying to get at, right? Is if we can take that moment in any situation, we can train that system um, to to be accessible to us. And if we ourselves can can do that for ourselves. We have the ability to model that for others and to be able to co-regulate. And, and that's the point of, of all of this really is, um, is you know, whether we call it relaxation, whether we call it co-regulation, um, whether we're thinking about it in a high-performance sports context or in another context, um, being able to take that moment to ground ourselves in the situation, which I think often requires um, some sort of bodily awareness, being able to say like, hey, your feelings in this situation are legit. Okay, I'm feeling, I'm feeling this thing and it is legit. Getting grounded, kind of acknowledging what's going on in our bodies then that gives us the space to be able to recall, like, what is it that I want to do here? Why, you know, what's my intention? What, what am I trying to do? And, and probably for coaches and supporters and parents, we want to, um, you know, be able to respond to the situation at hand in a way that, that doesn't traumatize or re-traumatize re -traumatize ourselves or others. Um, and so, so having that intention in mind, then we can really attune to, to who's around us and to ourselves so that we can co-regulate. That could also be the C here, consider what will serve compassionately um, is, is a way of co-regulating um, so that we can engage the way that we, we um, that serves ourselves and serves our team in this moment. Um, and or end any escalation so that we can be in this, this safe and social responsive kind of frame. Um, so I'll stop there and maybe we can, can talk a little bit um, about any practices or modifications you would like to explore um, for your team or your athletes or yourself. Um, or to address any questions that that have come up as we've been um, as we've been talking here tonight. Uh, I have I have a question uh, regarding race since we're since we're on that slide um, right now. So, do you have any tips or tricks or or or, or ideas of how as a coach? you can implement these themes and kind of help our athletes utilize, you know, these, these types of self-regulation or, um, you know, self-attunement. How, how could we, what are some tips for, for a coaching perspective um, to, to allow our athletes kind of, to kind of develop these skills? Love it. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I, I think really what, what Michelle said earlier about being able to model it for others is, is what we want to be able to do, right? We want to be able to be in a place where we can give ourselves this grace and show our athletes like it's possible 
it's possible. We, 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 your coaches, we, your supporters, we, your parents, we take the time to give grace to ourselves. And then that's really important in order to be able to give it to others. And so it could be that, um, that you demonstrate relaxation to your athletes, which can be really, really vulnerable as a coach. Um, because, and as a parent, I'm sure I, I, you've got a million things to do. You could probably keep doing, doing, doing all the time. You could probably be in a sympathetic state uh, 24 hours a day and, and still have things tugging at your attention. If you're able to show your athletes, like I am going to give myself the time and space that I need to take a breath, take a moment to notice my own body and what's going on in my own body and whatever it takes for me to do that in this time, um, I, I've got my practice of doing that and it's a priority for me. I take this time to attend to my own body and that's, that's a good thing. That's something that, that high performers do to sustain high performance. Um, high performance doesn't mean go, 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 go in sympathetic state all the time. It means I give myself grace so that I can give others grace and then we can co-regulate together to, to be able to, to do what we, we want to do. I wonder, is that, does that, um, how scary does that sound to you coaches and team leaders to, um, relax in front of your athletes and to, um, to have something that you do to support your athletes, uh, be not doing, did that make sense? Yes. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll let that marinate in the audience because I definitely have some reactions as well. Okay. <laughs> easier said than done. I will definitely say easier said than done. Yeah, uh, so I'll, I'll just kind of dive in. And before I answer this, uh, just to ask you, Meg, um, you have one more slide. Would you like to touch okay, on? Sure, sure. Let's see what's on it. Okay, great, great, great. Um, but before we do that, I'll go ahead and kind of give my thoughts on how um, uh, to, to your question. So, I think that it's very scary uh, because you, know, as a as a coach, as as a as a leader, you need to be that beacon of knowledge, right, or or, or direction. Um, but kind of bringing those walls down. And, and, and I think that's extremely beneficial for the athletes to see um, because everyone is human and everyone has those thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Um, I think that if you are able to do this, I think that the, the coach-athlete relationship will, will deepen, you know, and that trust will build. And then inherently, that team cohesion and that sports performance would, would ultimately improve as well. Um, those are my thoughts. I agree with you. Yeah, so let's jump to that last slide and then we will go into some questions from the audience. I know I have a few uh, and then we'll wrap up for the evening. Wonderful. Oh, cool. Wow. Okay. Well, let's, let's read some poetry. Yeah. Um, so, so this is, is Rumi. This being human is a guest house. Every morning is a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, a momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Treat each guest honorably, the dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Um, I, I really love this poem with athletes, for athletes. Um, again, as we, we discussed, uh, our athletes can be their own harshest critics. They can, um, can really, really let the, the self-judgment um, come at themselves pretty hard. And 
sometimes we have lots of feelings that we don't want to have and it can be hard to tune into those feelings it's much easier to judge the feelings and say well i shouldn't be tired or i shouldn't be angry or i shouldn't be um sad that i'm not traveling to this tournament or i shouldn't be jealous of um of tommy because he is traveling to this tournament um and we start to judge the feelings and when we judge the feelings then we don't tune into that bodily awareness like what's actually going on in our own bodies because we're we're judging ourselves for having the feelings so i really like this poem um as something if if your athletes like poetry that they can read and remind themselves like hey okay every feeling i have um there's something it, it's legitimate and i am going to tune into that so that I can can appreciate what's going on in my own body and I can then respond the way I want to respond. So so a, a little poem for for bodily awareness practice, if that's something that your athletes are interested in or that you're interested in. I like this one. Um, so I, yeah, I, I would, I would, that, that was a lot of random stuff in a very short amount of time. Um, would love to answer any questions if I can, or try to respond to questions. Uh, well, uh, the, the, the audience is either gathering questions. I do have some for, for you as well, but uh, one thing I, I would like to touch on is reading through this poem. There are some just emerging themes that I, I'm picking out from each, almost each, each sentence that I would love to share for our own athletes and even coaches. Um, but some themes that I'm seeing, and in, 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 I guess poetry is up to interpretation, but tell me if you, if you agree with this, um, you know, that every day is an opportunity to work on your goals, right? Um, you know, uh, sportsmanship, right? The not getting too hyper-focused on those poor performances that you may have had. I mean, those are like the main things that I'm seeing jump out of my screen when I'm reading this. And I think it's, it's, it's wonderful. And it's definitely something that I'm going to be sharing throughout our, our youth, youth as well. Yeah, I have a question for you, Meg. Um, so in your, one of your first slides, you talked about kind of how self-regulation and mindfulness, it, it impacts team cohesion. So if this is, if one person is at that kind of breaking point, right, on the team, it's going to have a ripple effect to the rest of the team. Uh, but you also mentioned that everyone has their own kind of um, personal preference about how to be mindful um, and relax at the same time. So with a team with so many different athletes and personalities and preferences, how can we ensure that kind of our, uh, we're on the same page as we enter the court or the water or whatever the sport is, right? Um, so that we're, we're cohesive as a team in that way. Now, that's a wonderful question. And I think it's something that's important here is probably something that, that you already do all the time. And it's knowing each other as whole human beings. And knowing that, okay, when um, when Caroline goes on court, um, this is what her her energy looks like. This is what her pregame routine looks like. This is what her optimal state of arousal looks like. And I can tell because I care about Caroline and we've trained together. Um, I can tell if maybe she's, you know, low energy, or I can tell if she's maybe teetering towards that sympathetic two state. And I know that with Caroline, maybe she likes a high five, but no words, don't comment, don't ask her questions, just, just a, a little encouraging touch. And I know that works for Caroline. And I know that, that Tommy, um, you know, I, I know that Tommy's energy looks this particular way. And so I can tell when he's low energy, or I can tell when he's headed towards that sympathetic too. And I know that he likes, um, you know, banter and uh, trash talk or fun to whatever it is, right? Um, so knowing each person as a whole human being and knowing what each person's optimal state of arousal looks like. And that, that sounds like a really tall order with a team, 
but probably it's something you do already. It's probably something that all of your athletes and all of you coaches and staff are tuned into right away and, and you're cultivating it. So, so that, that's probably not a very satisfying answer. No, uh, that, that, that is. And, you know, essentially from what I can hear, you're saying team cohesion is at the center of, of this entire presentation, right? Um, so your athletes knowing each other and having that sense of community um, is going to be, you know, crucial for having mindfulness on, on the field of play. So I think, yeah, I think that's great to kind of address that foundation. Absolutely. That's a, that's a wonderful question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, so, so throughout our, our, our presentation and in all these wonderful themes, uh, we talked about a lot about practices or, you know, on court, um, situations or, 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 or whatnot. So, um, question for you is, you know, does this research, these techniques, these practices also carry off the court, off the field, out of the water and, you know, impacts, whether it be education or employment or, you know, these different factors in our, in our, in these athletes' lives? I think so. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think so. I don't have the expertise to speak to um, too much outside of sport performance, but, um, you know, a lot of these I've borrowed from other fields and, and have been, you know, kind of um, integrated in a variety of, of settings, right? So, um, so Babette Rothschild, that, that, that color-coded scale, um, she's, she's talking about people who are recovering from, from trauma. So people who are in kind of, um, acute phases of, of recovery from trauma. Um, Stephen Porges, who is the, the father of polyvagal theory that we've been talking about, um, his work has been brought into like every domain of counseling um, that there is, you know, whether it be relationship counseling or um, education, um, it, this, this ventral vagal tone, this safe and social system that we have is, um, is crucial for us probably all the time as, as the social beings that we are. That would be my, um, my, my overstepping answer into domains of which I, um, I, I don't have the competence to speak. I'll just speak as a human being. That's, that's me as a human being. <laughs> my answer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I couldn't agree more. I think that, um, all of the, the techniques that you were, you know, describing to us would, would definitely translate to all those different domains of life, you know, employment, education, independent living, transitioning into whatever that next life phase may be. Um, I think these would be extremely beneficial to, to master and be also more and more self-aware. Um, so uh, if you have any other questions uh, to those in the audience, um, feel free to ask them now, put them in the chat. Um, but I do have a, a, a wrap up question that I would love to hear from you, Meg. Um, it's more of, I guess, a personal anecdote I'm asking for. Um, but would, would you explain a time or, or an instance or something that you reflect back into your experiences that you've had an athlete utilize these different techniques or you've seen it in action um, you know, during competition practice? And in how would you describe that it impacted them or, or, or benefited them? Yeah, so, so I, I love that question. And, and there are many... Um, many stories I would love to tell. I'll try to tell this one from, um, from an international tournament that was fairly high stakes between two rivals. And um, it's a team sport, synchronous sport, and uh, it's a very close game from the jump. And, uh, you know, back and forth there, you know, every, every, um, every change of possession really was a change of lead in the game. And the one team, which was the team that, that I was working with, um, had a pretty bad turnover 
in in the second quarter, the beginning of the second quarter of the game. And so so this back and forth was interrupted a little bit. And then another one after that. Both of those turnovers happened, um, you know, just in the way that things happen during a high performance game. You have things that are our strengths and you know their strengths and you deploy them and it doesn't work out the way that you wanted because you've got to take a risk to be at that apex of high performance. Everyone in the situation recognized that for what it was. You take a risk in a high performance situation. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. Hey man, it's all right, next play. And so they played into the end of the second quarter, other team really having a great game, end of the second quarter, they've come to, to a possession that, um, that the other team could, could you know, take a, a larger lead to take into the second half. And the other team has, um, has a turnover and the response is very different. Uh, there is a little bit of, of, um, of a reaction to the situation that, um, that puts some of the other teammates into a state of recognizing threat. And so the end of the, end of the half ends with the team that I'm working with still down, but the atmosphere has changed a little bit. Their opponent has had a turnover. And after that turnover, you see bodies in a state of threat. We come out in the second half, still the, the, the team that I'm working with is playing their own game. They're doing what they do. They're taking the risks. And this time the risks are working out for them. The other team has fallen apart just a little bit. It ends up being um, not a close game. The, the, the team that is looking at each other like, hey, we take risks, we take them together, um, you know, wins by 10 points. Whereas, you know, at the end of, of the, the first half, they were still, they were still down. But they're taking those risks and they're recognizing it. even when those risks don't work out for us, we're here fully in the situation at hand. Um, and, and you can see they've put in this training of doing this together of being able to take that moment and recognize like, okay, made a mistake, fine, next play. Um, and, and that's really hard to do in a high stakes situation to not get spun up and think like, oh no, I threw the ball away. My teammates are going to be mad or I'm mad at myself. Um, or, oh man, my teammate threw the ball away in this close situation. How could, how could they do that? Um, but that, that training of that ventral vagal tone to be able to be fully present in the situation at hand, um, it becomes accessible to us in high stakes situations when we integrate it into our training and you can see that play out. And it's one of those things that enables a team to, um, to maybe come together and do something that's, that's very difficult, very challenging. Um, and it may not have anything to do with uh, physical skill or talent, um, but that, that ability to be present together and to recognize when we're present together, when we're fully present together, it does entail some risk. Sometimes risk doesn't work out for us, but if we come back together, we, we can put our energy into what we do have control over right here, right now. So I don't know if that's, um, you know, if, if that answers the question, but, but yeah, no, it, it, it does. And, and then some, so thank you so much for bringing that a, a real life situation and kind of painting the picture and, and the way that I've seen it, uh, well, the way I'm interpreting it is you had one team that had that strong team cohesion, had those coping skills mastered. And then you had another team that may not have had as strong team cohesion. Um, and, you know, it just kind of drives home that, you know, that team cohesion is so important and impactful, but also that coach athlete cohesion, if it's more individualized sport, um, or even that internal cohesion with yourself, you know, yeah. or coping and whatnot. So um, I really appreciate that story. Thank you. 
Oh, good. Well, that sorry, I don't I don't want to talk past. I'm taking up everybody's time here, but I think that's a great point about um, an individual sport there as well, because that that same safe and social system can can be very useful in an individual sport, right? If I am in a safe and social state where I am, um, you know, going out to to run or to swim or um, to throw whatever it is. I can look at my competitors as, yeah, maybe I want to beat them. Like maybe I want to win, but every single one of them can make me better. Like, I'm so glad this person is in this race because when I swim against him or her, I always, you know, I I'll swim faster. Or if I run with this person, even for, for just one little part of the race, I know I'm going to be faster. So if I can engage that ventral vagal system, that safe and social state, I can see my competitors as people who, um, who, who are here with me and together will be better. Um, if I'm in the state of seeing threat, then I'm going to look at this competitor and I'm going to think, oh man, she is so much faster than me. I, I just, uh, I might as well not even run the race. Right. So, so getting into that safe and social state, all the people around us are part of this, this thing that we're doing and we're all trying to, to get better together. Um, when we get into that state of threat, when our body is recognizing threat, it's really hard to, um, to harness that energy in that way because all of our energy is going into protecting ourselves. Um, so, thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to. No. No, that was great. I mean, you hit some really impactful points uh, and, and also highlighting that more individualized sport. I, I, I really, I really thank you. And also thank you for taking your time um, and giving us this amazing content. Um, it was very thought provoking. And um, I, I would hope to think that everyone tuning in live or to the recorded version um, participated in some of these really good techniques that you um, instructed uh, and also um, can take something away from this. So, uh, Meg, thank you so much for giving time. Yes, your thank you so much, Meg. It was wonderful. Oh, thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. It's nice. To, I wish I wish I could um, could meet you all and hear about the wonderful work you're doing. Um, feel free to reach out on email if if you have questions. Yes, and also to all of our viewers, whether that you be uh, you're live or you are listening to the recorded version, thank you for uh, spending time and listening to this awesome content. Um, feel free to follow us on our various social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, um, and stay tuned for an all a uh, bunch more youth lead content, webinars, trainings, resources. Uh, and again, thank you all. And Meg, have a wonderful night. Thank you all.